Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk uh, today. Uh, and uh, I learned uh, a lot uh, through uh, all the talks in, in this workshop. It's uh, uh, very fascinating. Um, so what I will be talking today is indeed uh, how we can use co-design for quantum sensing, but maybe we can use co-design from quantum sensing to uh, improve uh, uh, our devices. So uh, my, my title, I wasn't sure what to put in the end. Uh, but the idea is the following, that really uh, the quantum sensor can be part of the quantum ecosystem, not only as a one application, which hopefully is a more near term as uh, we are discussing in this particular session of, of the workshop, uh, but also as an enabling technology for many of the other application of quantum information. So we can use uh, um, quantum sensing to design a sensor, and we can use them to identify the Hamiltonian characterizing uh, the devices and also the noise which affects them. Uh, so this will lead us to hopefully have better control and in the end indeed to have overall uh, better sensor. So it's uh, all this cycle in which a uh, quantum sensor uh, both uh, play an important role and also benefit of course uh, from uh, the all the uh, parts that uh, we develop here. So I will try to illustrate this concept with uh, a few examples, um, which are uh, taken both uh, from, from my research, but I think that hopefully uh, teach uh, a more general uh, message than the, the particular examples. So the first one is uh, on how we can uh, use uh, indeed uh, knowledge of the noise in order to uh, devise uh, better uh, quantum sensor and how we can do that by uh, getting inspired by what uh, quantum uh, computation has done uh, for a long time. So before I describe that, I just want to have a brief, uh, brief recap on one of the tools which is used uh, very, very often uh, when you use a, a qubit sensor uh, for uh, many applications. And this is a uh, so-called dynamical decoupling. This is a technique which is used uh, for error corrections. So it's, um, if you want, uh, uh, a, a low-level form of quantum error correction, which tries to decouple your systems, your quantum system, from the noise. So, for example, if you assume that the main source of noise is just uh, the phasing, we can use a spin echo and maybe a longer pipe for sequences uh, uh, to protect uh, uh, your qubits from the noise itself. And the idea is that uh, what you're trying to do is to refocus the quantum system faster than the noise uh, can act on it. So, for example, a typical sequence that we have is a call a spin echo, uh, where we uh, would initialize um, our qubit system, for example, in the transverse plane, and then uh, the qubit will start, uh, um, of course, evolve. But if I have some noisy field um, along the z direction, then the exact evolution of the system will depend on particular instances of uh, that noise field. So if I look at an ensemble average over of many qubits or uh, maybe the same qubits when you repeat the experiment many times, every time the phase which is acquired is a bit different and this leads to the phase. However, if by the half of the evolution, I apply a pi pulse, this invert the uh, direction of the evolution itself and now this dephasing gets refocused, get uh, uh, shrunk back to, uh, to zero, so that when I measure, I recover the exact signals. Of course, this means that if I have a static field that I'm trying to measure, this also get canceled out, and so it's not very good for sensing, and this is a, a recurring theme of, uh, of sensing, where we need some compromise between uh, how well we decouple the system from the noise and how well we keep the uh, target field of, uh, of interest. If, however, the field that I want to measure oscillate in time, and in particular, <clears throat> it oscillate exactly at the same time as the spin echo, then the phases add up, and I can indeed uh, um, gain information about uh, uh, the, the, the target field. So this is uh, indeed uh, uh, a, a very common uh, scheme which is used. And of course, you can imagine that we don't want to just apply a single pi pulse, but uh, a series of pi pulses, so that if the noise is fast, the correction is better. So I can look at these pulse sequences, these control sequences in the time domain, and this will lead to, um, if you want, uh, a simple function which oscillates between plus one and minus one, which modulates the phase which is acquired. But I can also look at the same sequence in the frequency domain. And now this looks like a filter 
at the frequency which correspond to the period, or if you want, the pulse spacing of your uh, frequency. So this can be used, of course, to achieve uh, better uh, qubit coherence. Indeed, uh, the coherence time or the decay of the uh, qubit coherences depend on the overlap of your filter function with the noise spectrum. So if they're quite far away from each other, it means that the decay is uh, small, this chi function is small, and the decay is very slow. So this can lead us to have better qubit coherence if indeed we know what is the noise uh, spectrum so that we can tailor a particular uh, pulse sequence in such a way that it will not have a large overlap to the noise. But how do we know what is the noise spectrum? Well, we can actually use these same ideas uh, to sort of uh, map out what is the noise spectrum by uh, sweeping the timing in between pulses little by little so that we can reconstruct this whole uh, noise spectrum. And so we can do a noise spectroscopy using the same uh, tools. So how can we then use this idea in order to have better quantum sensor? Well, we can try to borrow ideas from uh, quantum information, which uh, and quantum computation, which for a long time has used uh, uh, numerical searches to find optimal controls for the control uh, sequences, which maximize some desired evolution. Typically, this is a uh, parameterized in terms of the fidelity of the unitary operator. Uh, we, what you uh, achieve uh, with your natural system and control with respect to the ideal uh, unitary operator that you would like to implement. This same strategy, however, has some problems when we try to apply in quantum sensing uh, for various reasons. Well, first of all, the Hamiltonian itself is not known. The Hamiltonian is typically an input into these searches, but here the Hamiltonian includes the field to be measured, which we actually do not know. That's why we do sensing. And so it, uh, it becomes a uh, sort of impossible to have the same type of numerical searches which are done for quantum computation. Also, for quantum sensing, you can uh, live with much more noise than uh, in quantum computation. Uh, and so typically the noise is much more dominant and we had to deal with uh, an evolution which is not unitary anymore. So we want to sort of uh, include that into the optimization itself. Overall, the fidelity is no longer a, a good metric because what we are trying to maximize is not uh, the fidelity to one single evolution, but instead the sensitivity with which we can measure an unknown field. And so we have sort of to come up with new ideas on how to achieve optimal control for quantum sensing. And this is what we did a few years back. We decided that a good uh, uh, metric for the optimization is actually the signal to noise ratio or the sensitivity as expressed here. And this, as you can see, is uh, uh, if you want a compromise between minimizing how much you, you decay due to noise. Again, you have this uh, chi function, which depends on the spectral overlap between your noise spectrum and the filter function and how much information you extract about some time varying field, BOT, so this uh, phase is just the integral of this uh, time dependent field. And so uh, what we want to do is to minimize a chi and maximize this um, chi of t in order to have the best possible sensitivity. People have used this uh, equal space pi pulses in order to do this. Uh, this uh, uh, cancel out uh, somehow optimally uh, noise at low frequency and can extract information from some uh, uh, field if they are at some one particular frequency. However, if you have a multi-frequency field or if the frequency overlaps substantially with the noise spectrum, then you're not gonna be able to achieve very good sensitivity. Then what we can do is to let the timing in between pulses be a free parameter and optimize over that. So we can map out this was a, a very, very uh, simple uh, case of, of just one single uh, frequency with a noise at a, a particular other frequency. And we can optimize that so that initially you have a bad signal to noise ratio, but then your optimization brings you to a minimum of, uh, uh, or if you the maximum of the signal to noise ratio, or a minimum of the sensitivity. And this is achieved by changing these uh, um, distances between pi pulses. We can actually uh, show that uh, this strategy 
So to apply ideas from quantum computation, like these optimal control ideas to sensing, can actually give you an advantage on uh, a practical system. And we use um, uh, the nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond to demonstrate this. So these are uh, very well-known defects in diamond, uh, which give you uh, an electronic spin one, and we can address them and read them out through um, optical means so that we can really look at individual spins. We can also have a very good control on the systems by using microwave radiation, which address one of the transition, let's say between zero and minus one. And so when the spin is in zero, it will emit a lot of light. When it's in one, it emits less light. And so we are able to read out the spin. So what we did was to look at one of these MV centers and uh, the goal was to sense um, uh, a signal with uh, a true frequency under the presence of the natural noise, which is always uh, in the system, in particular, the noise created by nuclear spin and carbon-13 in the diamond. Um, if the uh, noise, uh, if, if the signal that you want to sense, um, it is a relatively high frequency, far away from the frequency of carbon-13, which is typically uh, like just a few kilohertz in a normal magnetic field, then the problem is not very difficult and you could use these equally spaced uh, sequences or uh, carbon cell sequences to have very good sensitivity. However, when you have a lot of overlaps, these uh, equidistant pulses are no longer um, optimal. We can achieve much better signal to noise ratio as I simplified here, uh, if we indeed uh, use uh, um, much uh, uh, optimized uh, sequences, where in this case, uh, we optimize quite long sequences in order to have enough parameter to find the solution. So again, we compare what is uh, the typical uh, CP solution, which is only optimal for one particular uh, times, with a much broader and also better overall uh, signal to noise ratio obtained with uh, the optimized sequence. This is uh, already an interesting result, uh, in my opinion, but uh, the point is that, well, what we had to do was to force characterize very well uh, the noise spectrum of one particular MV centers in one particular diamond and use that in order to achieve a good sensor. What would be better would be to do this uh, in real time. So you have a sensor, uh, you use both uh, your uh, uh, control sequences uh, to reconstruct what is the noise spectrum and also then uh, to uh, figure out uh, uh, what is, you, you then uh, run a quick optimization algorithm and then you can implement to have a better uh, signal to noise ratio in uh, detecting a field of interest. However, uh, this optimization was, as I said, over many, many parameters. And so it was relatively um, slow. And so it was not really possible to do things in real time. We more recently uh, found a nice uh, uh, mapping of the problem into actually an Ising problem. So uh, it's uh, very nice that I, uh, my talk just comes after uh, Andrew talks because you already discussed a lot about the uh, spin Ising model. So we are able to map uh, the optimal control problem into actually classical Ising problem. So it's not even uh, so difficult uh, to solve uh, if you want. And what we have is that we have classical spin, which can be either pointing down or up. And uh, the, uh, their signs, their direction is just a map to the uh, sign of the phase uh, during uh, the evolution time. So every time that I have a pi policy, this correspond if you want to um, a, a boundary uh, domain uh, for my spin chain. Then uh, we respect to the metric that you want to optimize, which is again like the fidelity, or more precisely in this case, the logarithm of the fidelity, yeah, sorry, of the, the distillate noise ratio, the uh, logarithm of the sensitivity. We can see that we can map the energy of the system uh, with uh, couplings, uh, mapping or encoding the information about uh, the noise spectrum, uh, while the target field is encoded in sort of a slightly different type. Uh, of a magnetic field for a single spin, and it's, uh, it has a logarithm, but the energy is quite, quite different. And so we can indeed um, use uh, all um, good uh, uh, algorithm which has been developed to solve the problem of finding the ground state for this uh, simple Ising chain. 
in particular simulated annealing, in order to find um, a good uh, solution to the problem. And the algorithm now become much, much faster than the, uh, if you want, uh, brute uh, optimization that we had done before, which was done uh, by uh, much simpler method, because we have a good encoding of the problem. And so we think that with this method, we should be able to really uh, achieve uh, this uh, real-time optimization of the control sequence that you apply on the sensor, so that we are at the same time understanding what is the noise of the system and then using that to optimize the sequence that uh, we need to apply in order to extract information about the signal. So this is a, a, a nice solution to uh, optimizing uh, your quantum system, which is enabled indeed by the fact that we are able to actually characterize uh, the noise spectrum in a robust way. However, this problem of characterizing the noise spectrum in a robust way is actually not a trivial one. And we actually discovered that it has a lot of uh, uh, issues, uh, if you want, uh, by uh, looking at uh, a, a very uh, concrete uh, systems. So what are the challenges here? How can we hope uh, to achieve robust quantum noise spectroscopy? And um, uh, maybe when this is not gonna be uh, possible. So what we are interested in is, of course, to try to characterize the noise of quantum devices. So again, try to characterize the noise really at the nanoscale. And this implies that we will have, of course, both a complex quantum environment and also variation of the noise, which might be, again, at the nanoscale. So how can we, uh, uh, what type of challenges we will encounter when we are trying to characterize such a noise? So in the end, what we would like to have is, as a result of our noise characterization is a simple noise model. So we want to have, hopefully, a classical noise model so that we can then use it uh, to build uh, um, dynamical decoupling sequences or maybe quantum error correction schemes. If we have a noise model which is too complicated, it's not really going to be uh, very useful. That's why, indeed, uh, we do not use uh, the environment uh, as a resource because we cannot characterize it completely. We want a, a noise model which is simple enough. However, if the environment is very complex, it is difficult to find a model which uh, uh, completely uh, captures it. And so, uh, maybe if I apply some known uh, control sequences, the noise will still look like the one that I characterized. But if I now uh, try to steer my qubit in a completely different way, uh, some uh, peculiarity of the noise might start to emerge. So what I would like to find is the most uh, possible robust type of noise that I have. Sometimes uh, uh, if the environment is too complex, and again, it might be of quantum nature, uh, even a uh, uh, characterizing uh, the, the noise uh, becomes challenging because uh, indeed uh, I cannot find good control sequences. Unless I know very well what is my uh, noise, it's difficult to find good control sequences. So in some sense, I can have a, a virtual cycle where I use some control, I can characterize the noise, this improves my control, but sometimes that's not possible. You actually have a vicious circle. <laughs> you try to characterize your noise, but actually you don't have control good enough to allow you that task. And so your control cannot be improved and, and you're stuck in, in there. So how, uh, uh, when uh, things uh, work and when things do not work and how can we try to uh, sort of mitigate this? Well, here we were trying to characterize uh, the, uh, what is the quantum environment of one envy centers and a nearby spin impurity, which is coupled strongly enough to the MV center that we can actually control it and use it as a qubit. However, the environment is made up of many other spin defects, and some of them have resonances which are close enough to this, uh, to this spin here, which we call X spin because we don't really know it's uh, still an unknown spin, uh, that we cannot control the spin well enough. However, for the MV center, things work out pretty nicely. So we can use a known dynamical decoupling sequences to characterize the noise and hopefully find a classical model. And then we can check that indeed, if we apply the same sequences, extension to it, but also some sequences which have nothing to do with the one that we use to characterize the noise, our noise model is still predictive of the dynamics. And this is, as I say, this virtual, virtual circle, which allows us to then build better devices because now we have characterized completely the noise of our spin qubit and we can now control it in a, in a very good way. 
However, sometimes this classical noise model is not good enough to actually describe the overall evolution and we are stuck with a problem. So for the first case, what we did was to uh, combine different noise spectroscopy method so that we were really able to uh, not only uh, predict a noise model, which uh, might be able to tell us, well, if you apply another uh, sequences with equidistant pulses, and you still find that this is well characterized uh, by the prediction of your noise model. But we can also try to look at uh, uh, frequency regimes where the, uh, uh, these dynamical decoupling sequences cannot give us a good result because we cannot uh, extend their coherence time to such a long uh, um, times and, and low frequency. And uh, also uh, by combining uh, sequences like so just Ramsey and spin echo sequences here and these are uh, uh, dynamical decoupling for longer uh, for higher frequency, we are able to find um, now a noise model which can actually predict uh, evolution under uh, non-symmetric pulse sequences. And so we can demonstrate that indeed uh, the noise spectrum that we find is much more robust than if we had only used one type of noise spectroscopy. Here we still use all types of pulse noise spectroscopy, but you can think of uh, uh, combining, for example, a continuous way noise spectroscopy and other methods to really find more robust uh, uh, noise uh, models. For the uh, uh, X-spin, as I said, we found some surprises. So first of all, uh, we actually tried just to apply the same exact method that worked very nicely with the MV centers, uh, but pretty quickly we started seeing something which was very weird. So in particular, if we were applying uh, uh, dynamical decoupling sequences, we expect to have just a simple decay, and instead we were seeing oscillation of the signals. This is a reminiscent of what happens when you try to do so-called double electron-electron resonance. You try to drive two spins, which are uh, have two different um, um, frequency. And if you apply pulses on both of them, while well, their interaction is uh, refocused, and so uh, you start driving oscillation or polarization exchange between uh, the two spins. So this is what sort of looks like it's happening. And indeed, if we reduce uh, the strength of our drive so that we become more frequency selective, this oscillation disappear, meaning that we are now really just uh, driving uh, the X spin and not the other nearby spin. However, of course, if the uh, pi pulses are very, very weak or they take a very long, it becomes more and more difficult to characterize the noise. So we're still sort of able to find some uh, tentative model for the noise, but it was not uh, particularly good. And, and so it becomes more difficult to indeed uh, uh, find a very robust classical noise model for this system. On the flip side, uh, what this has led us to, and uh, we are still working on this, is that we actually discover that, uh, yes, we have an MB center, we have an X pin, actually we have a second X pin that we can, we, we call it X1, we have another one which we call X2, and now we are actually able to coherently uh, um, uh, connect to uh, at least one of, the, uh, of these other spins. And this have now become our Y spin. And so we start to uh, sort of like increase more and more at uh, the size of uh, our control uh, quantum system uh, so that uh, uh, we can hopefully look at uh, uh, even uh, more uh, uh, like uh, larger Hebrew spaces, which might be useful indeed for, um, uh, for, for quantum computations. So this sort of uh, uh, teaches uh, as a, a few um, a few lessons that uh, indeed uh, uh, quantum sensing uh, it's uh, um, and, and quantum noise spectroscopy are, are very good tools to to try to uh, understand your systems. And in particular, one thing that uh, we discovered was that the noise affecting the MV center and these other spins, even if they are sort of separated by something like um, eight nanometers as uh, as we characterize them uh, in another work, uh, their noise is quite different. And so uh, this uh, um, uh, will have a lot of implication once one uh, want to develop, for example, quantum error correction codes, because indeed we had to take into account that there, is, uh, there are different noise affecting them. So again, uh, this is uh, an example of how uh, we uh, need to really characterize very well our systems in order to have uh, better uh, quantum devices. And uh, another example of this is another work in which we actually try to uh, improve uh, our quantum sensor uh, themselves. 
And this can be done by having better material characterization, which is done using the sensor themselves. So it's sort of, a, uh, we use a, um, the sensor to characterize themselves so that we can have better sensor. Here, the idea was to, um, for a specific, uh, particular um, application, which was to use a nuclear spins as quantum gyroscopes. So any spin uh, can be a very good uh, um, uh, detector of uh, rotations. Indeed, uh, uh, NMR-based uh, uh, gyroscope have a long history, but they also have many drawbacks, mainly because they're based on uh, atomic vapors. And so they're relatively bulky, and it's difficult to really miniaturize them and, and make them into uh, good uh, devices. So uh, a, a few years ago, uh, by now, uh, 10 years ago, actually, we, we and some other groups had the, the idea to use the, the nuclear spin associated with the NV centers uh, as uh, uh, gyroscopes. Indeed, uh, um, uh, typically, uh, any spin will acquire the same rotation independent of how strongly uh, they're um, sort of uh, uh, interacting with magnetic field. So even if electronic spin interacts about a thousand times uh, faster with a magnetic field, you know, so they're good uh, magnetic field sensor, while nuclear spin are abysmal magnetic field sensors. Um, for rotation, the two have more or less the same sensitivity, and actually nuclear spin are better because indeed their coherence time is much, much longer. So we can use the nuclear spins uh, to uh, indeed uh, detect uh, this rotation. And there has been uh, a few um, uh, um, experiments uh, uh, like uh, this past year really demonstrating uh, this, this concept. Of course, uh, we need still the electronic spins uh, in order to have a compact device because we still exploit the MV centers to achieve the polarization, also the, if you wanted the initialization to a low temperature of the nuclear spins, to read out uh, the state um, of the nuclear spin and to control them. So if we didn't have the electronic spin, we would be um, stuck with the typical NMR gyro, which as I said, is not uh, that good. But thanks to the presence of the electronic spin, we can have a much more compact system at a solid state with much better sensitivity because we can exploit the coupling to the electronic spin uh, to have better initialization without and control. However, of course, the electronic spin also mediates uh, noise. And so typically we expect the nuclear spin associated with the electronic spin to have a less uh, or a shorter coherence time. So this is an image of, uh, of our diamond. As you can see, uh, we use a large ensembles of uh, spins in this case, uh, so large that the diamond becomes black because it absorbs uh, the whole light. Because indeed, if we didn't have these large ensembles, the sensitivity of this nuclear spin will be uh, not good enough and for sure not comparable with the leading technology, which is based on maps for gyroscope. This is another image of our setup where the diamond is now here illuminated by um, the, the green light. The problem with uh, working on large ensembles is that now the coherence time of the nuclear spins seems no longer to be just uh, uh, limited by the T1, uh, the relaxation time of the electronic spin, as we were expecting based on results on a single spins. In particular, uh, what uh, we had set up uh, to do was to uh, try to decouple the electronic spins from the nuclear spins so that they would be uh, uh, somehow uh, more uh, protected. Uh, but the first thing that we were trying to do was then to measure what was the coherence time of the nuclear spin depending on the state of the electronic spin. And we saw that if the electronic spin was in a mass equal zero, it doesn't have any coupling, uh, expected coupling to the nuclear spin, and the coherence time was relatively long. If, however, we put the NV centers in the minus one state, the coherence times become much, much shorter. And so, of course, we cannot really uh, sort of uh, uh, flip-flop between zero and minus one to try to decouple the NV center from the nuclear spin, otherwise we will have uh, at, at most something in between, but not uh, a good coherence time, yeah, for sure. So we try to identify what was going on. And of course, uh, the first idea is that when the MV center is in the plus and minus one state, the nuclear spin feels the hyperfine field. 
And so we expect to have um, that maybe if there is amino majorities in this hyperfine, we would have a, a decay of uh, the nuclear spin. Indeed, the hyperfine is on the order of two megahertz, which is tiny for the electronic spin. But for the nuclear spin, this corresponds to almost one Tesla magnetic field. So even if I have small inhomogeneity, I would have a large effect on the nuclear spins, even if uh, on the electronic spin, it would not be a large effect. And indeed, it has never been seen before uh, because people have focused on the electronic spin and not on the nuclear spin. So we set up to find uh, a new experiment to probe this effect. And in particular, what we did was to simply sweep the timing of a simple uh, spin echo in order to see uh, when uh, a good recovery uh, was obtained. What we found was that the spin echo is sort of working, but for a time which is unusual. So spin echo typically works by indeed putting a pi pulse in, at the middle of the time um, evolution. Well, here we found that actually you needed to sort of to uh, let your system evolve for a long time under uh, the electronic spin being ms equal zero and only for a short time under the uh, electronic spin being in the uh, minus one state. And indeed this can be explained by assuming that I have not only inhomogeneities in the hyperfine but also in the quadrupolar interaction of the nuclear spins. Indeed, this is uh, what the Hamiltonian of our uh, electronic and nuclear spin looks like. The, electron, uh, the nuclear spins has a quadrupolar interaction and the hyperfine interaction to the electronic spin. So if the electronic spin is in zero, uh, the phase which is accumulated is mostly given by uh, the quadrupolar. While if it's in plus or minus one, it will be given by the quadrupolar and hyperfine. The magnetic field was relatively small, and also we were able to calibrate uh, pretty well thanks to the electronic spin itself. So if I have inhomogeneities in both the quadrupolar and the hyperfine, this will induce a decay. Of course, uh, if I'm in the plus or minus one, the decay is faster because I have also the hyperfine. <coughs> I could think of just staying always in MS equal zero, but then I'm not able to uh, erase the decay due to the, uh, to the quadrupolar. And so the idea is to combine evolution for MS equal zero and MS plus and minus one, but is again, do some sort of pi pulses on the electronic spin, but here acts in, uh, as our noise source, such that the uh, two um, inhomogeneities are canceled out. And this leads us again to this optimal uh, pulse uh, uh, timing here, uh, which is at about 20% uh, of the time, quite unusual. What is interesting is that the ratio between uh, the hyperfine and the uh, quadrupolar homogeneities has a priori no reason to be fixed for all spins, while instead we found that that's indeed the case. And so by using this uh, uh, unbalanced echo, we were able to improve uh, 20 times uh, the coherence time of uh, our um, uh, nuclear spins. And we are actually not uh, acting at all on the nuclear spins. And so the nuclear spin evolution is still uh, available uh, to achieve a good sensing of, for example, uh, rotations. As I said, the origin of the homogeneities um, uh, for uh, the quadrupolar and the hyperfine uh, seems uh, uh, to sort of uh, the, uh, be linked. And indeed, uh, uh, we uh, were able to link this uh, to temperature variations in, in our samples. Indeed, uh, we were also able to just change uh, the temperature in the system by uh, increasing uh, how long we illuminate the system with the laser, which heats up uh, the diamond. As you can imagine, we, we shine a lot of watts of laser onto uh, a tiny spot on the diamond. So we, we get quite huge uh, um, a variation and, and in the temperature. And so we were able, as a function of the temperature, to measure uh, how much the quadrupolar and the hyperfine uh, were in changing. And we find that there is a, a precise ratio between the two. We can actually uh, find uh, a good uh, theory based on the second order phonon effect to describe uh, this variation. And although the, um, the ratio is not constant over all uh, frequent uh, temperature ranges, 
Uh, if uh, you have uh, temperature variation, which are on the order of 10, 20 um, uh, degrees, uh, then uh, the, 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 the ratio is pretty stable. And so you're able to, uh, to refocus the system. And you can think, of course, of moving even forward. So these are the um, um, variation in uh, quadrupolar and the uh, and, uh, um, hyperfine uh, for our systems, as I say, you can find the regimes where this is uh, quite uh, linear. And so we, you can um, sort of uh, um, correct for them. But you can also think of uh, uh, finding other defects which have different uh, um, uh, properties with respect to temperature or maybe strain. And so you might be able to, uh, to then uh, devise a, a better sensor, uh, some which are even more sensitive to temperature. And so you can use them as thermometers, some which are instead less sensitive. And so you can use them as gyroscope, as magnetometers um, by uh, indeed optimizing what are their properties. And so uh, in some sense, uh, we can uh, we're sort of like uh, closing the circle, the circle uh, we are able to detect these uh, temperature variation and these effects using a quantum sensor. Uh, we can then uh, predict them uh, uh, um, from, from theory and, and numerical simulation. And then uh, uh, we hope to be able to uh, find uh, what other uh, systems might be better based on, on this uh, theoretical exploration and hopefully then implement them in practice. So again, this is a, another example on how uh, indeed uh, trying to um, uh, sort of uh, improve your hardware uh, will make uh, um, the, the, the task of quantum sensing uh, even better. Finally, I want to uh, present some ideas on how uh, we can try to use uh, error correction uh, for task specific, so in particular for, for quantum sensing, and how indeed uh, in this case, uh, quantum error correction uh, will look somehow different uh, from uh, what you would uh, implement uh, in quantum computations. So just uh, as a brief reminder, although probably for this audience uh, not uh, really needed, uh, what do I mean uh, by uh, quantum error correction? Well, uh, one of the simplest case uh, is uh, uh, the case in which I have, uh, for example, a bit flip error. So uh, I, I, my qubit is initially in zero and because of the error will become one and vice versa. Then the simplest code that I can implement uh, uh, just for illustrative purpose is the repetition code where instead of uh, uh, having uh, one uh, qubit in zero, I will have a repetition of three uh, qubit in zero, so that my logical uh, qubit uh, is zero, 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 and similar, uh, the one logical qubit is one, one, one. If I assume that only one error occurs, I can still take the majority vote and correct for the error which has occurred by applying some kind of a recovery operation. So how can this be implemented while at the same time doing a uh, sense? The idea is quite simple. So for sensing, the typical sensing algorithm, um, if you want to sort of describe it with some sort of a qubit circuit, is to apply, let's say, Hadamard gate, which will prepare a state in a superposition. Then you can apply a Z gate, uh, in this case, uh, a gate which uh, apply n times some, some given uh, fundamental phase, and then perform uh, a, a readout, uh, for example, in the X basis, or again, like another Adamar gate, and then readout of the population. What you can do then is to instead try to divide the evolution in many, many different gates, one after the other, and alternate the gate uh, with uh, some recovery operation, which are enabled by entangling uh, your quantum sensor with another ancilla. So these types uh, of, uh, um, of schemes for uh, quantum error correction for, for sensing have been uh, sort of proposed by now uh, quite a few years ago and even uh, implemented experimentally, but they have some sort of uh, drawbacks, as I, I will explain uh, in the following, which makes them not so, so practical. Um, and even the theory which explain when uh, error correction for quantum sensing or ECQS uh, is possible uh, was sort of uh, um, not particularly uh, promising from a practical uh, point of view. Indeed, uh, there has been some works which uh, laid out what formal requirement for the existence of error correction codes for ECQS. Uh, which was based on uh, properties of the system Hamiltonian, uh, which is 
uh, if you want the, just uh, the part of the Hamiltonian which connects to the uh, field that you want to measure, and um, like the, the Limbladian describing the noise. In particular, what you want is the following. So the signal, uh, which is encoded by the Hamiltonian, should be somehow perpendicular to the operators uh, which encode uh, the noise. So uh, the Hamiltonian should not be in the span of the algebra generated by, uh, by the Limbladian. If when uh, this Hamiltonian is perpendicular uh, to uh, the noise, then uh, you can find codes, while when that's not the case, uh, the code cannot be found. This uh, sort of like a, a block sphere interpretation of what this uh, theorem says is somehow, um, uh, I would say, uh, a bit pessimistic because of the following. So it seems really uh, to require uh, that uh, the uh, signal and the noise they act along two different directions. But that's not really practical. So first of all, like this, this theorem actually also requires noiseless ancillas. Uh, and you can imagine that it's very difficult to come about uh, with um, some uh, qubit, which is completely uh, noise free. Also, it's very difficult to find uh, some signal which doesn't have any noise associated with it. So typically, you will always have some noise associated with your signal, some variation around the, the signal that you're trying to measure. And finally, um, if you are trying to detect something, let's say a field in the z direction, you would use uh, a quantum system, which is particularly sensitive to the fields in that direction. And then it makes sense that the main source of noise will also be fields which act in the same direction, act in the same way. So the fact of uh, having a signal and noise acting on different direction, it's not something which really occurs uh, in nature or, or even in system that you would use really for, for your sense. So is there a solution out of it? Luckily, uh, yes. Um, and this was found uh, by uh, one of my former students who is now uh, working at IBM. And the idea was to actually exploit a spatial correlation as a way to distinguish between signal and noise. So you don't need your signal to be along the z direction, let's say, and your noise along the x direction to distinguish the two. You can just exploit spatial correlation. And this is uh, quite interesting. So. If you compare dynamical decoupling, where you distinguish signal and noise based on temporal correlation, or uh, this idea of the noise being orthogonal to the signal, you sort of uh, uh, use algebraic coupling. Now you can add a third way to distinguish the noise uh, from the signal, and this is special correlation. So for example, if we have three qubits, which I can use for the repetition code, I can expect that I should be able to measure something like a uniform signal, as long as the noise on the three qubit is somehow correlated in a different way and not uniform. And indeed, that's the case. So we can sort of reformulate uh, these formal requirements uh, for, uh, uh, for the existence of the um, error correcting for quantum sensing uh, for the particular case of spatial correlation. So we can assume an Hamiltonian, for example, the simplest case of measuring a parameter in the z direction, uh, z are just uh, uh, poly operators. And this will define a vector which identifies the Hamiltonian itself. Then we can also define the Limblad operator in which we extract some correlation between various components for a spin uh, i and j of the noise itself. And this also gives, if you want, a correlation matrix. Then we can find the quantum error correction code as long as, uh, if you want to be the correlation matrix, describe correlation which are different from the correlation in the signal itself. Formally, what we want is that this vector uh, describing the Hamiltonian is not in, uh, in the column space of the correlation itself. So when we uh, consider this, we are now able to find a broader set of uh, potential uh, error correction code then if we just uh, try to find the correction code for, let's say, signal along Z and uh, uh, a, spin, uh, a bit flip uh, type of noise. For example, if I consider a two qubit sensor, uh, I can find uh, a quantum error correction code only if the noise is anti-correlated, and then I will have uh, the ability to measure uniform noise. Or if I have a noise which is perfectly correlated, I could do, for example, radiometry or measure differences in the field. Things becomes more interesting when I start increasing the size of my um, uh, quantum sensor. So for example, for a three qubit sensor, if I want to measure a uniform Z field, 
a potential possible code is indeed the repetition code. Uh, but now it's used not to uh, detect errors uh, such as the, the bit flip error, but still some type of the phase and noise, which are whoever has some uh, correlation. For example, if I have uh, that all the matrix elements CIJ are minus one alpha for the phasing, this code now becomes a decoherent free subspace, so I don't even need to uh, apply a recovery operation. If that's not the case, I will need to apply recovery operations. So for example, we can find some particular form of uh, the correlation matrix and based on that, uh, find out what is the optimal sensitivity for uh, a given uh, code. So uh, we can compare what is the, um, I think that uh, uh, my parallel, uh, it was like a flat line here. So uh, it's a flat line uh, at a, a suboptimal sensitivity. While if I use this GZ code with an active error correction code, I can have a much better sensitivity, which depends on how much um, uh, or not the system is itself correlated. So indeed, uh, how well uh, the uh, error correction works will depend on uh, how, uh, in, if you want, uh, correlated the system is. And I can think that if I have a given uh, correlation, uh, maybe instead of uh, using the GSC, uh, I can find a better uh, code which is tailored to that particular correlation. So again, it's important to characterize uh, uh, the noise spectrum uh, and the noise correlation in order to have the best possible sense. So in, indeed, uh, we can uh, try to do that by, again, maximizing the quantum feature information, which is, um, if you want, uh, a more formal way of defining the signal-to-noise ratio, but the two are connected, uh, um, especially if you have a simple uh, a quantum sensor with, without too much complication in them. And this is uh, uh, one way now that we can try to really optimize the QFI uh, by uh, finding uh, good error correction codes uh, if we also as, uh, have as input uh, uh, correlation in the in the noise spec in the noise, and so we are able to uh, to do that and, and show that indeed uh, uh, you can find uh, some um, correction codes uh, which at the same time allow you to achieve a quantum sensing uh, almost at this Eisenberg uh, scaling uh, in time. Again, uh, the, the, the main message also of this final example is that you need to character noise, uh, and in particular, doing multi-qubit spectroscopy as we did with uh, our two uh, electronic spin uh, systems in which we were able to find correlation in the noise between the two qubits in order to find good, good quantum error correction. So this uh, just brings me uh, to, uh, to my conclusions that uh, I tried to show to you uh, that not only quantum sensors uh, are already uh, providing some quantum advantage, and, and I think that we are a near-term technology, but they're really, really important um, in the quantum ecosystem in order to enable the design of better quantum ad ad hardware and also to improve the control of uh, this quantum hardware itself. And in particular, what uh, becomes uh, uh, what they enable through uh, the discovery and the characterization of the noise is to find better error correction schemes. Uh, which can be a dynamic decoupling, but even a quantum error correction codes. And also they can provide a, a much insight into the complexity of the quantum system and the quantum environment, uh, which is really important because we need to really adapt uh, error correction uh, to the uh, details uh, of, uh, uh, of the environment, uh, such as uh, uh, correlation in both time and space. Uh, otherwise, uh, um, typical error correction, which uh, have been uh, uh, invented uh, under uh, assumption of uh, um, uh, the uncorrelated noise, might not really work. So before concluding, um, here as uh, a picture, which is uh, too recent to show all the people who um, work on this. I, I want to um, highlight in particular David Leiden, who's uh, still uh, working uh, on, on many uh, quantum problems now at IBM and uh, obtained some great results and uh, he's done uh, a lot of work on error correction. Um, uh, some work uh, that I presented on uh, optimizing um, quantum control for, for sensor uh, is done with uh, a collaboration with people uh, in Italy at, at Lens and, and uh, the CISA, so uh, Nicole Fabric and uh, and then some of, uh, of the uh, more recent work um, on the um, uh, NV quantum sensor was done uh, by Calvin Sun and by Bushing. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to answer questions. <laughs>